In this lesson, we're going to go over the most frequently tested and highest yielding areas of law in civil procedure on the bar exam in 60 minutes or less. In other words, we're going to go over the absolute must know stuff in civil procedure, right? I had the opportunity the last week or so to go back over every single civil procedure fact pattern that's been released by the National Conference of Bar Examiners. Fortunately, right, we license all that material so I have access to the entire bank from 1997 until today. Went back over all of those fact patterns with a fine tooth comb. Uh, looking for the patterns and the things you kind of see tested over and over again in civil procedure to try to find those areas that we can go over where I think you're going to have the most opportunities to collect points in civil procedure on the bar exam, right? And historically speaking, without a doubt, it's going to be jurisdiction and venue, right? Below the video, we can put all of the exact data for you if you want to look at that, but you can take my word for it, right? The areas of law that are going to be most frequently tested and highest yielding in civil procedure, historically speaking, are jurisdiction and venue, specifically subject matter jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction, and venue, right? So in this video, we're gonna to try to be as efficient as we can possibly be and go over this information, right? And my focus here within all of these areas are going to be the areas within these areas of law right, that are frequently tested, right? Obviously in 60 minutes, I can't go over every single aspect of these topics, right? This is like an entire semester of civil procedure in law school, and we're going to do it in 60 minutes, right? So important to recognize my focus intentionally is going to be on those areas that are most frequently tested, right? And again, the good news here is I did just go over literally every single fact pattern from 1997 until today, so I have a good idea, right, of what areas within these subjects, within these topics, is going to be the highest yielding, right? What we really need to focus on here. So please bear with me. We're going to try to do this as efficiently as possible. You know, with that, I'm going to kind of just introduce the topics and we're going to just start going through them as quick as we can, right? So with that, though, I'm going to set my timer over here to one hour and I'm going to get this going ready let's go right so the clock has started so the good news right in civil procedure is the most frequently tested areas of law the highest yielding areas of law really have a nice flow to them and other subjects we'll see that we don't have this type of flow necessarily between all the high yielding areas of law so this makes my job a little bit easier right because the way we can kind of think about these topics on the board jurisdiction and venue and civil procedure for the bar exam is like this, right? As elements, right? A civil court, whether it's a state court or a federal court, right? Has to have three things in order to have the authority to hear and decide the case before it, right? What does the civil court need? Again, whether it's a state court or a federal court, the court needs subject matter jurisdiction, right? Subject matter jurisdiction over the particular type of case that's before it. Number two, the court needs personal jurisdiction over this particular defendant. And number three, right, the court needs venue in the proper judicial district, right? All three of these have to be satisfied in order for the court, the civil court, whether it's a state court or a federal court, to hear and decide the case before it, right? If any of these are missing, the court lacks subject matter jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction, or doesn't have proper venue, right? The court's either going to have to dismiss that case or move it to a court that does have all three of these things, right? Subject matter jurisdiction over the particular type of case that's being heard, personal jurisdiction over this particular defendant, and venue in the proper judicial district, right? And very quickly, we can kind of just talk about what the differences are between each of these so we know where we're going, right? So subject matter jurisdiction, right? The cool thing here is we're really only discussing or worried about subject matter jurisdiction as an issue when we're dealing with federal courts, right? We say that state courts are courts of unlimited subject matter jurisdiction. They can hear just about any type of case under the sun, right? Unless there's a federal law 
that precludes that type of case from being heard in state court. For the most part, right, state courts can hear just about any type of action, right? The example I commonly use here is imagine you hire your neighbor's kid to mow your lawn for 20 bucks, right? He doesn't mow your lawn, you pay him the 20 bucks, right? So you wanna sue that kid for breach of contract, right? Well, you're never going to be able to bring that state law breach of contract claim against your neighbor in federal court, right? A federal court doesn't have subject matter jurisdiction over that type of case, right? A $50 breach of contract claim against your neighbor, that doesn't rise to the level of the type of case that a federal court can hear, right? And we're going to see that federal courts have very limited subject matter jurisdiction. There's only a small, very narrow set of cases, types of cases that a federal court can actually hear. Right, we're gonna see the big two are federal question jurisdiction and diversity jurisdiction, right? Federal question jurisdiction, meaning that the plaintiff has filed a complaint that alleges a claim that arises under federal law, right? So if the plaintiff is alleging a claim that arises under federal law, well, then a federal court could hear the case, right? That's the, a type of case a federal court can hear. Diversity jurisdiction is about citizens from two different states or from a different country with a amount in controversy over $75,000, right? So we're gonna break these down in a lot more detail. All we wanna recognize here though is for a federal court to have subject matter jurisdiction, right? It has to be a very specific type of case, right? We need an issue, a federal law alleged by the plaintiff, or we need diverse citizenships and an amount in controversy that's high enough, right? The $50 breach of contract claim against your neighbor's kid, right? Not the type of case that can be heard in federal court, right? So next we have personal jurisdiction, right? Personal jurisdiction, we have to think about whether it's a state court or a federal court, right? The same analysis applies whether it's a federal court or state court. So personal jurisdiction is all about essentially fairness for the defendant, right? Defendant. If for subject matter jurisdiction, we're really thinking about the particular type of case, right? Does the federal court have jurisdiction over this particular type of case? With personal jurisdiction, we're asking, does this court, whether it's a state court or federal court, have the authority to adjudicate the rights and liabilities of this particular defendant, right? Important to recognize that the plaintiff gets to choose where to file an action, right? Plaintiff gets to decide what state, whether it's a state court, a federal court, right? What forum he's going to file the action in. Plaintiff gets to choose, right? So you can imagine how this can be pretty tough for defendants, right? The example I always use here is the Alaska example, right? In my life, I've never been to the state of Alaska, right? I don't know that I've ever met anyone from Alaska. I don't own any property in Alaska. I basically had zero contact with the state of Alaska in my entire life, right? Here it's beautiful, but I've had no contact with it. I know nothing about Alaska, right? So imagine that I'm driving my car, right, in Miami, Florida, right? It's about as far away from Alaska as we can get in the United States. Say I'm down there in Miami, Florida, and I get into a car accident with somebody who's on vacation from Alaska. Right? And say that driver that I hit because he's from Alaska wants to sue me in the Alaska state court, right? Well, for me as a defendant, that's going to be very tough to fly out to Alaska and adjudicate this lawsuit if I'm in Miami, Florida, right? The deal is here, the court, that Alaska court, is probably not going to have personal jurisdiction. They're not going to have the authority to adjudicate my rights and liabilities as a defendant if I've never had any contact with the state of Alaska in my life, right? This is a constitutional due process requirement. In order for an Alaska state court to be able to adjudicate my rights and liabilities as a defendant, right, I have to have had some contact with the state of Alaska, right? Maybe I've been there or maybe, right, and we'll explore what level of contact is required when we get to our minimum contacts analysis. But a defendant generally has to have some level of contact, has to have some relationship with the forum state. Right, And by the way, when I'm saying the forum state, that just means the state where the action was filed. So if the plaintiff files the action in Alaska, right, the forum state is Alaska. And the question is whether Alaska has that Alaska forum has the authority to adjudicate my rights and liabilities as 
a defendant. So with personal jurisdiction, again, we're really thinking about fairness kind of for the defendant. Does the defendant have some contact with the forum state here, right? Because if not, if it's Alaska and this person's never been to Alaska, has no contact with the state of Alaska in their entire life, we're gonna see that that Alaska court does not have the authority to adjudicate the rights and liabilities of that defendant, right? In other words, they don't have personal jurisdiction over the defendant. That case is going to have to be moved to a court that does have personal jurisdiction over the defendant, a place where the defendant has had some minimum contact, right? Finally, venue, right? This will be the easiest analysis of these three fourths. We'll move through it really quick at the end, right? Venue is just all about the proper judicial district, right? Especially on the bar exam. On the bar exam, when we see venue tested, it's really more in the context of federal courts, right? So we're going to focus on venue in federal courts, right? And so venue in federal courts, the question will be whether the federal court has proper venue in the proper judicial district, essentially, is what we're asking, right? And probably everybody watching this video knows what judicial districts are, but every state, right, has at least one district, right? Larger states have four districts. Some states have two districts, three districts, but at most you're going to have four districts, right? And some states only have one district, right? And usually it's broken up by direction, like it'll be the Northern District, the Eastern District, the Southern District, the Western District, right? New York, right? It'll be the New York, you know, Northern District, New York, Eastern District, New York, Southern District, right? California, same thing, right? So. Those are the districts of the state. The question will be the district where this action has been filed. Is that district proper? Does this federal court have venue in the proper judicial district? Right. Again, if not, that case will have to be moved to a court that does have proper venue. Right. And venue we'll see, though, is a pretty easy analysis. Right. It's just two quick steps and you'll be good to go there. So don't worry too much about venue. We'll get there at the very end of the video. What we really want to focus on and where the majority of your points are going to come from are subject matter jurisdiction and personal jurisdiction, right? So let's quickly jump into subject matter jurisdiction. Remember, we're only doing a subject matter jurisdiction analysis if the forum is a federal court, right? If it's a state court, we're basically skipping subject matter jurisdiction, right? If the plaintiff has filed the action in a state court, right? We know state courts can hear just about any type of case. They'll hear that $20 breach of contract claim against your neighbor's kid in state court. That's not going to rise to the level of a federal court, right? But anyways, right? If we're dealing with a federal court, right? And we get to our issues and we see that subject matter jurisdiction is at issue, right? We want to think about the following four things, right? Federal question, diversity, supplemental, and removal. So again, subject matter jurisdiction is about whether the federal court has the power to hear this particular type of case. The main two types of cases that a federal court can hear are federal question cases and diversity cases. So let's just talk about federal question jurisdiction first, right? Federal question jurisdiction is a really easy analysis, right? The rule will want to say on a bar exam fact pattern, right? And I'm going to use a lot of buzzwords that the bar examiners give us so that we're all using the type of language I know that the bar examiners really want to see in essays, right? Federal question jurisdiction, we're thinking well pleaded, right, complaint rule or the well-pleaded complaint, right? So the idea here is if the plaintiff alleges a claim on the face of their complaint that arises under federal law, the court will have subject matter jurisdiction, the federal court will have subject matter jurisdiction over that claim under federal question jurisdiction. The key to understanding a federal question jurisdiction analysis is putting the blinders on, right? What you want to do on a fact pattern, right? And it's going to give it to you, right? If federal questions at issue, the bar examiners in the fact pattern are going to tell you what the face of the plaintiff's claim alleges or what the face of the plaintiff's complaint alleges, right? And what you want to imagine in your head is the four corners of that complaint, right? You really want to think about exactly what the plaintiff is alleging on the face of that complaint. You want to find those claims, right? It might be one claim, it might be two claims, it might be three claims, right? But they're going to be 
given to you as exactly what the complaint alleges, right? So you want to find those and ask, do any of these arise under federal law, right? If so, then the court is going to have federal question jurisdiction over those claims, right? The federal court can hear a claim that arises under federal law under federal question jurisdiction, right? The thing that we want to look out for here, and by the way, the bar examiners are going to make it clear whether or not it arises under federal law, right? They'll put the word federal in the statute. It'll be like the Federal Automobile Safety Act or under the Federal Gun Safety Act, right? Plaintiff is alleging a claim for damages of $100,000 under the Federal Gun Safety Act, right? It'll tell you the word federal will actually be in the claim, right? That's how you know, oh, this claim arises under federal law. Right, what we want to really look out for and where I see this tripped up sometimes is when the defendant is doing stuff, right? When the defendant is alleging anything, raising a defense that looks like an issue of federal law or the defendant is countersuing under a federal law claim, right? We don't care what the defendant is doing, right? So if plaintiff sues, right, with plaintiff versus defendant, Plaintiff sues for a federal or for a state law claim, doesn't matter what, say it's just a pure breach of contract state law claim, right? Defendant countersues, files a counterclaim, rule 13 for some federal copyright infringement claim, right? Say we have a federal claim coming back from the defendant, right? The court does not have federal question jurisdiction over this claim, right? We only, the well pleaded complaint rule says in order for federal question jurisdiction to be satisfied, right, we have to look at the face of the plaintiff's complaint, right? So if the plaintiff alleges a claim that arises under federal law on the face of their complaint, then the court has federal question jurisdiction over those claims. Whatever the defendant's doing, we don't care about. It's irrelevant in our federal question analysis. So we don't wanna get tripped up by that. Otherwise, it should be pretty obvious, right? We should be able to very quickly determine whether federal question jurisdiction is satisfied, right? Next, after federal question jurisdiction, right? We just look at the face of the plaintiff's complaint, look at those claims. Do any of those claims arise under federal law? If so, right, court has federal question jurisdiction. Next, we have diversity jurisdiction, right? The next big one we wanna look out for is diversity jurisdiction, right? So if we're trying to determine whether the federal court has subject matter jurisdiction over a claim, can the federal court hear this particular type of case? Well, they can if diversity jurisdiction is satisfied, right? Diversity jurisdiction, we're going to have two elements. Number one, we need complete diversity, right? We need complete diversity. And number two, right, we need the amount in controversy to exceed $75 thousand dollars if both of these elements are satisfied right then the federal court will have subject matter jurisdiction over the claim under diversity jurisdiction but we need both elements satisfied right so let's start with this first element what's complete diversity well here we say that every citizenship on the plaintiff side of the case every citizenship represented on the plaintiff side of the case has to be different than every citizenship represented on the defendant side of the case so what you should do right and we'll talk about how you determine what citizenship is for diversity purposes in a second but what you need to do on a civil procedure bar exam fact pattern is draw it up like this so you put all of your plaintiffs or you write this in the margins or on your scratch sheet of paper are you plaintiff one plaintiff two plaintiff three versus right defendant one defendant two defendant three right you'll put that up on the board and you want to identify the citizenship of each one of these parties right say that the plaintiffs are from new york and california you'll just write that right like that and then say the defendants are from texas right texas and florida right so plaintiffs are citizens of new york and california defendants are citizens of texas and florida question is is complete diversity present 
is every citizenship represented on the plaintiff side of the case different from every citizenship represented on the defendant side of the case? What you can do is just draw little brackets around the V and see if any of these match. Do any on this side match any on this side? Here the answer is no, right? Every citizenship represented on the plaintiff side of the case is different than every, every citizenship represented on the defendant side of the case. Therefore, complete diversity is present, right? But say that this defendant three, right, actually is a dual citizen, right? Let's change the fact pattern. Say that defendant three is a dual citizen, right? We'll see that corporations for diversity purposes have dual citizenship. So let's say defendant three is a corporation and they're citizen of both Florida and California. Now, is complete diversity present? Well, the answer is no, right? Plaintiff three and defendant three share citizenship, right? Every citizenship represented on the plaintiff side of the case is not different than every citizenship represented on the defendant side of the case. So complete diversity is not present, right? So that's how we do this first element. The question next is, okay, well, how do we determine citizenship for diversity purposes, right? And we'll see that it depends on the type of party involved in the action, right? We'll either have individuals, Right, so we have individuals, we have corporations, right, corporations, and then we have unincorporated associations, right? These are the big three that you're gonna see commonly tested, right? Individuals are for diversity purposes, right? And it's important to recognize here that when we say citizenship, we don't mean it in the way that a layman might use citizenship, right? Like, oh, he has a passport from Canada and the United States, he's a dual citizen, right? No, that's not what we're talking about when we're thinking about citizenship for diversity purposes, right? It has a very specific definition depending on the party involved, right? So when we're thinking about citizenship in determining diversity in a diversity jurisdiction analysis, right? We say individuals are going to be a citizen where they are domiciled, right? So individuals, it's domicile. Important to recognize that an individual can only have one place of citizenship, one state of citizenship at a time. And it's going to be where they're domiciled, where they live with an intent to remain indefinitely, right? So this on a fact pattern would be things like, you know, man, right? Man sues woman or Bob or Sally, right? These are individuals, right? It could be pronouns or just nouns, right? It could be man, it could be man sues woman, Bob sues Sally, right? Husband sues wife, whatever. All of those are individuals. So if we want to know where Bob is a citizen for diversity purposes, we know Bob can only have one place of citizenship at a time. He can't be a dual citizenship like this is drawn up on the board. Individuals can only be a citizen of one state at a time, and that's going to be where they live with an intent to remain indefinitely, right? Should be pretty obvious from the fact pattern. It's like, where is their house? Where do they live, right? With an intent to remain indefinitely. Don't get tripped up if they have like a vacation home somewhere else, right? We don't care about the vacation home or if they travel other places, right? It's where they live with an intent to remain indefinitely. That's how we determine citizenship for individuals. For corporations, corporations hold dual citizenship, right? They're gonna be a citizen of two different states, right? Could be one though, if it's the same state. So here you have state of incorporation, right? And principal place of business. So the state where the corporation is incorporated, right? In real life, this is usually Delaware, right? Because Delaware has favorable business court systems, right? So you see a lot of corporations are incorporated in the state of Delaware, but their principal place of business, right? Where they're headquartered, right? This is the nerve center test, right? Nerve center test. If you remember that from law school, principal place of business, where is the nerve center of the company, right? Of the corporation. That's what we're going to call the principal place of business, wherever that's located, which is usually the headquarters, right? The HQ of the corporation, wherever that's located is going to be the principal place of business. So if a corporation is incorporated in the state of Florida, where they filed their articles of incorporation is with the secretary of state in Florida, Right, but their principal place of business, their headquarters, their office is in California. Okay, right, they have dual citizenship in Florida and California. Unincorporated associations is easy, right? It's just all of there can be 
you know, three, four, five, however many members are in the unincorporated association, all of the citizenships of all of those members are where the unincorporated association is going to be considered a citizen. So if you see a LLC or a trade union, right, anything that's an organization that's unincorporated, right, it's going to just be where are all of their members citizens of. Wherever all of their citizens are members of, they're going to be considered a citizen of all those different places. So you could have, you know, a defendant who's an unincorporated association, right? There's one member from Texas, there's one member from New York, there's one member from Florida, right? It can be a citizen of all those different places. That would be LLCs, trade unions, any association that's not incorporated, right? They didn't file articles of incorporation like a corporation, right? Okay, so that's how you determine citizenship, and that's important for determining this first element, right? We need to know where every party is a citizen to be able to draw this up, right? And to see, and see is every citizenship on the plaintiff side of the case different from every citizenship on the defendant side of the case, right? So that's complete diversity. The second element that we have to see met is the amount in controversy requirement, right? The amount in controversy is the monetary value at stake in a lawsuit, right? This is usually really easy on a bar exam fact They're just going to give you the amount in controversy by telling you how much the plaintiff is suing for, right? That's what it's going to look like. It's going to be like plaintiff sues defendant for negligence, right, on a $100,000 claim. Right, well, your amount in controversy is $100,000. So here, if plaintiff is a citizen of New York and defendant is a citizen of California and the amount in controversy is $100,000, we know, right, diversity jurisdiction is present over that lawsuit. That's super easy, right? We have complete diversity and the amount in controversy exceeds $75,000, right? What if plaintiff from New York sued defendant from California for $75,000, right? $75,000. This would be rude if the bar examiners actually did that, but we should know it, right? What happens here? Are both elements satisfied? Well, we do have complete diversity. Every citizenship on the plaintiff side of the case is different than every citizenship on the defendant side of the case. However, right, the amount of controversy does not exceed $75,000. Right? What if this was $75,000 and one penny? Okay, now it exceeds the amount in controversy requirement, right? So we would have diversity jurisdiction. Both elements are satisfied in that case, right? The only other area with the second element, amount in controversy, that can get a little bit tricky is when we have multiple claims, right? Say that you have a plaintiff from New York suing a defendant from California for two separate claims, right? Say this claim, claim number one is $60,000, right? Is $60,000 and claim number two is $40,000. Well, both of these claims isolated, right? Neither one of them exceeds $75,000. Here, we know the first element is met, right? Every citizenship on the plaintiff side of the case is different than every citizenship represented on the defendant side of the case. So first element's easy. The problem is the second element. Neither one of these claims actually satisfies the amount in controversy requirement by itself. The question becomes, can we aggregate these claims together? Can we add 60,000 plus 40,000 to get to 100,000 to exceed the amount in controversy requirement? The rule is easy, right? If you have one plaintiff suing one defendant, the answer is yes, right? You can always aggregate those claims. So in this case, we have one plaintiff suing one defendant. You can aggregate the claims to get over the $75,000 amount in controversy requirement. What happens though if we had two defendants, right? Imagine that this claim isn't against the same defendant, it's against a second defendant, right? Say we have another defendant from Florida, right? And this is for $40,000. Can we aggregate these claims to meet the amount in controversy requirement, right? One plaintiff suing two plus defendants. The answer is yes, if jointly liable, right? If the defendants are jointly liable, 
you can aggregate the claims and the fact pattern will usually give that to you, right? So if you have one plaintiff suing multiple defendants, right? One claims 60,000, one claims 40,000, you need to add them together to exceed $75,000. You can aggregate the claims if the defendants, right, this California defendant and this Florida defendant are jointly liable. If they have that relationship of joint liability, then you can aggregate the claims, right? So what happens if you have, right, multiple plaintiffs suing multiple defendants, right? Multiple plaintiffs suing multiple defendants, right? If that's going on, then you would just say each claim, you can't aggregate those together unless supplemental jurisdiction applies, which you're going to talk about in a second, right? Each claim would have to independently satisfy the amount and controversy requirement unless we're dealing with some supplemental jurisdiction issues, which we're about to get into, right? But that is diversity jurisdiction and federal question jurisdiction. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Bar Blitz video series. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire Bar Blitz video library, which includes coverage of the most frequently tested and highest yielding areas of law in each bar exam subject, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled in Studicata Bar Review to get started started with your no risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com.